So one of the major discoveries of the 20th century in biology was the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule or the elucidation of the structure of the DNA molecule. And that occurred in 1953 when Watson and Crick d determined that the DNA had a double helix structure along the inside of which were these four chemical subunits called bases or nucleotide bases. And then four years later, Crick took that discovery one step further and realized that those, those chemical subunits on the inside of the molecule were functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters like the zeros and ones we use in software. In other words, it wasn't the structure of those, the chemical structure of those subunits or their molecular weight or their shape that mattered. What mattered was their arrangement in accord with an independent code that was later discovered called the genetic code. So inside the DNA molecule, what we have is literally information or instructions inscribed digitally or alphabetically, typographically, in a way that provides the information that's necessary to build the important proteins and protein machines that keep all cells alive. So this is a stop press moment in the history of biology. Uh, people have wondered for centuries, why does like beget like? And at least in the case of why we get new proteins that are like the old proteins, the, question, or the answer is the DNA contains the information for building them, and that's what keeps living cells alive. Well, we're here in Seattle, and we have you know, a lot of great companies here, especially tech companies, and we've got the famous Microsoft company that, that writes code in the form of software. We also have the Boeing company and other companies that use a technology known as computer-assisted design and manufacture. And that's a technology where information in a digital form is used to direct the construction of mechanical parts or physical systems. So if you're a Boeing engineer, you might sit at a console and write code, that code will go down a, a wire, it will be translated into another machine code that can be read at a manufacturing arm or, or, or center, and then that information will be used, for example, to take rivets and put them on the airplane wing at just the right place. So you have digital information directing the construction of a mechanical system. Something very much like that is going on inside the cell, where the information inside DNA is being used to direct the construction of the proteins and protein machines that are necessary for all cellular life. Natural selection and random mutation don't seem to be a very good explanation for the origin of new genetic information. And the reason for that can be understood by <clears throat> reference to our own experience with digital code, with software. If, if you're a computer programmer, you know that if you start randomly changing the sections of functional code, you're going to degrade that code long before you ever come up with a new program or operating system. And the same thing applies in the biological case, because the information in DNA is essentially digital or typographic. And because there are far more ways to arrange those A's, C's, G's, and T's along the DNA molecule that will result in gibberish than will result in functional information capable of building a new protein. Inevitably, as random changes accumulate, they're going to find those non-functional combinations. And the process of evolution is going to have, or the process of natural selection is going to have nothing to select. Remember, natural selection can only select for functional advantage. If the code is degraded by random mu mutations before you ever get to something new and functional, then the evolutionary process is going to terminate. So the natural selection random mutation process is very good for preserving existing function in an existing form. It can preserve slight variations on that form, but it can't generate anything fundamentally new. And that's why you have a lot of evolutionary biologists themselves today saying things like uh, natural selection and random mutation can explain the survival but not the arrival of the fittest. They explain the small scale variations or changes but not, they, they do not explain where major innovation comes from in the history of life. All right, the reason that random changes inevitably degrade the information in a DNA sequence is the same reason that random changes inevitably degrade information in a section of computer code or English text. For every sequence of 12 letters in English language that does convey a meaning, there are 100 trillion other possible ways of arranging those same characters that don't. 
And the same thing turns out to be true in the DNA protein case. For a modest protein of about 150 amino acids long, for every sequence that produces a functional protein, there are about 10 to the 77th other possibilities that don't. And what that means is then there's a huge search space that has to be searched by the random mutation mechanism to try to find the functional sequences in that, in that vast array of possibilities. And it turns out when you do the math, there isn't enough time, even assuming a four billion year history of life on this planet, to have enough replication events, enough copying uh, uh, events, to search that space effectively. You're going to end up with a time, even if all of those, every time an organism replicates from the beginning of the first life till now, a new mutation occurred searching for a new protein, you'd only search a tiny fraction of the total number of possibilities. And so it becomes much more likely that such a random search will fail than it is that such a search will succeed. The bottom line is the neo-Darwinian mechanism is just not a plausible mechanism for generating new functional biological information. As it's become clear that the various evolutionary mechanisms do not account for the origin of genetic information, there's naturally people have wondered, well, what might? And we've proposed an alternative explanation, and that is the idea of intelligent design. And the reason that intelligent design provides a good scientific explanation for the origin of the new information necessary to build new proteins and new forms of animal life is that we know from our experience that information always arises from an intelligent source. Um, whether we're looking at hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or information in a section of software code, or even information embedded in a radio signal. Whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, it always comes to a mind, not a, an undirected material process. So the discovery of information at the foundation of life and the discovery that big infusions of information are necessary to explain the origin of new forms of life suggests the activity of a designing intelligence in the history of life. The inference to intelligent design is based on our uniform and repeated experience of cause and effect, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning. We know from experience not only that the neo-Darwinian mechanism and other similar, more recent evolutionary mechanisms that have been proposed have failed to generate the information, the digital and functionally specified information necessary to build new proteins and new forms of animal life. We also know that there is a cause, we know of a cause that does generate functional digital code or digital information and that cause is intelligence. And we have experience of that in our own realm of software technology or, um, or our human experience. In fact, um, here locally our, our hero Bill Gates has said that DNA is like a software program only much more complicated than any we've ever created. Now what we know from experience is that it takes a programmer to make a program, to make a, a computer program. In fact, more generally we know that whenever we see information, whether it's a software program or a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book, whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. So the discovery of information at the foundation of life in every living cell of every organism and the evidence of big infusions of new information coming into the biosphere in the fossil record both suggest that a designing intelligence has played a role in the construction of the information necessary to life throughout the history of life. And so the, the inference to intelligent design is, is not just an argument from ignorance, it's not just a uh, we're not just saying that, hey, natural selection and random mutation can't generate new information, or various chemical evolutionary processes have failed to explain the origin of information. We're also saying we know of a cause that does produce information. That cause is mind, and therefore, based on that, knowledge, that positive knowledge of cause and effect, we can infer intelligent design as the best explanation because, in fact, it's the only known cause of the generation of functional information, especially in a digital or in an alphabetic form. Uh, one of the great information scientists of the 20th century said, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. That's what we know, and therefore the inference to design 
is a really strong inference from what we know both about the facts of biology and about what it takes to generate information. A lot of scientists, because of the influence of materialism, are in a way uh, inured to the reality of their own minds and therefore of minds in general. There's a kind of uh, computer simulation known as a genetic algorithm where evolutionary scientists tried to show how the mutation selection mechanism would work in a, and they do this in a computational environment. They write a little program, they try to get something that simulates mutation and selection to generate a particular sequence of characters or a phrase from Shakespeare was Richard Dawkins' preferred way of doing it. Me thinks it is like a weasel. But in order to get the computer to generate the sequence, Dawkins has to first give the computer the sequence and then he writes the program, his computer program, in such a way that as different randomized crops of, of letter strings are generated, the program selects the ones that are closest in function, or, that are closest to the, the, the future function that he wants. Now, none of the original strings have any linguistic function at all. They don't have any meaning. But the program selects the ones that, have the, that are closest to the future function that, that's desired. So he's selecting for proximity to future function, not actual function. Now that's problematic because natural selection selects for functional advantage. It doesn't have foresight to tell you what might eventually result in some future function. So the, the program that Dawkins generates is not actually analogous to what's going on in biology at all, or, or how the natural selection mechanism must work. But notice also, the extent to which it does work is entirely a function of his own mind, his own intellect. He gave the program the target sequence. He programmed the computer to select for proximity to future function. So these genetic algorithms invariably end up illustrating the need for mind to generate information. A similar thing happens with what are known as ribozyme engineering experiments. There, uh, chemists attempt to generate RNA molecules that are capable of copying themselves and thus could conceivably get something like natural selection going because there would be an element of self-replication. The problem is that as the RNA chemists, the ribozyme engineers have done their work, they've had to sequence the RNA molecules in very specific ways to get any copying capability out of them at all. As it turns out, they've only been able to generate RNA molecules that can copy about 10% of themselves. But even that limited self-replication capability is the product of intelligence because it was the intelligent agent who essentially, uh, nucleotide base by nucleotide base, determined the informational sequence that the RNA molecule or RNA ribozyme has. So again, what's being simulated? Well, it, it, it appears to us that what's being simulated is the need for intelligence to generate information. So far from the idea that intelligent design is the only known cause of information, and that far, far from the idea that our, the connection between intelligence and information is only a kind of common sense thing that has no scientific basis, we actually see that the attempt to simulate evolution is providing additional scientific basis for that connection. A lot of people reject the idea of intelligent design because they think that if you invoke the activity of a mind, you're invoking some unintelligible entity of which we have no real knowledge, um, or an entity, the conscious mind, which is not materialistic. But in fact, I want to argue that we know that we have conscious minds. We know our own consciousness better than we know anything else. In fact, all of our knowledge of the world around us is mediated to us through our senses and comes to us in our minds. So if the mind isn't a real entity, then we don't have any knowledge, let alone scientific knowledge. So mind is presupposed in all scientific inquiry. And, and getting rid of the mind as an explanatory entity is contrary to everything we actually know. We know from direct introspective activity, better than we know anything else, that we have minds and we also know from our introspective uh, activity the, the causal powers that our minds have, what our minds can do. And one of the things we know our minds can do is generate information. I'm doing it right now as we're speaking. So 
mind is a real entity, it's part of the world, and we've become inured to its reality. But it does really exist, and a good science will open itself up to all that takes place in the world, all the causes that are at work, including mental or conscious causes, causes that are generated by minds.